So, you're going to Vietnam. This beautiful country ranks high on our list of places to revisit and you'll see exactly why over the course of this video. There are a variety of visas based on how long you plan on staying in the country and your country of origin. We'll just use a 30 day single entry visa for the purpose of this video. You have a few options of obtaining the visa. One, you can visit a Vietnamese embassy before you go. Two, get a pre-approval letter online for a visa on arrival or three, simply do an e-visa, which is done online. The easiest and cheapest of all the options is option three, the e-visa. Fill out the necessary requirements online, wait a few days for the approval. You'll need to print this out and keep a physical copy on you. The total cost is $25 and it can be taken straight to the all passports line upon arrival. They will process it in the airport at no additional cost. The pre-approval letter has two phases. The first is completing the online form, which has an $18 service fee. You'll receive your approval letter via email, which you'll bring with you to Vietnam. Once you arrive in Vietnam, you must show your pre-approval letter and then pay a stamping fee of $25 per person. This process takes a little time as you have to wait in a separate holding area while they process and stamp your passport. We waited around 45 minutes. The last and most expensive option is to visit a physical Vietnamese embassy. When we went to the one in Washington, D.C., we were charged $90 for our visa and it occupied an entire page in our passport. Similar to the e-visa, you can head straight to the all passports line when you arrive and stamping is done at no additional cost. If you plan on staying in Vietnam for longer than 30 days or you need a multiple entry visa, we'll post some links below that are very helpful. From what we've researched, there are no compulsory vaccinations for Vietnam required before you visit. Although we would highly recommend that you're up to date on your tetanus and hepatitis shots before you arrive. Since we did some extensive travel in Southeast Asia, we took typhoid pills. We paid around $60 for the pills and the treatment process took one week. Aim to finish your treatment at least two weeks before you go. If you visit any CDC, they're gonna freak you out about virtually everything. They even try to sway us into taking a Japanese encephalitis shot just in case. We avoided that shot, brought some bug spray, and we were good to go. Point being, make sure you're up to date on your tetanus, hepatitis, take some typhoid pills, and you'll be just fine. One of the preferred methods of traveling Vietnam is either north to south or south to north. The country's two largest cities happen to be located in each point of the country, which makes it ideal for flights in and out. If you have the time and you're ready for an adventure, a common option is to buy a motorbike in either Saigon or Hanoi and drive it up or down the country and then resell it in your final destination. We thought about doing this but never got around to it, although we met more than a few people who were doing it and had an awesome experience. We don't know much about the expenses for that kind of experience, but there are more than enough blogs that are loaded with information. We've done both north to south and south to north, and we kind of preferred going south to north, but don't stress because they're virtually the same thing. Power in Vietnam is 220 volts and outlets will accommodate any plug type A or C. At this point, most of your electronics will have a voltage converter built into the charger so it can handle the power as it would back home. The best way to check is to look at the charger. Most of them will label the power voltage it can handle. For example, if it says input power 100 volts to 240, you'll be in good shape. A little trick we've shared before is bringing a three plug adapter. Because we travel with a lot of equipment, it allows us to charge multiple things at once. Internet in Vietnam is abundant and fast. Really fast. The country is mega connected and there are Wi-Fi connections almost everywhere. If you must be connected when you travel, this is the place to be. There was never a shortage of great, fast internet anywhere we went. We're not going to do a section on phone service in this guide, but as with most international destinations, you always have the option of buying a SIM card for your phone. We were able to get by just using Wi-Fi and downloading anything we needed prior to leaving our hotel. More on that in the app section later on. You've picked your arrival city and now it's time to map out your trajectory through the rest of the country. This is one of the easiest parts because there's so many options. Buses, trains, cars, and short flights interconnect the entire country. We found negatives and upsides to each method of transportation. Buses come in abundance. There are conventional sit-down buses and there are sleeper buses. The obvious advantage of the sleeper bus lies in its name. 
They're essentially seat beds that recline and allow you to get some shut eye between the destinations. These are a good choice for overnight hauls, but don't expect to get the most comfortable sleep. To all my tall people out there, if you are over 6'2", just be prepared to be a little bit more cramped than the average person. Being 6'8", I had to contort my body and ride with my legs bent in the sleeper bus, so maybe a conventional sit-down bus is more your speed. The advantage of the buses is they are one of the more economical choices and can save you money on a hotel room for that night. You may or may not already be familiar with the trains in Vietnam. This aging but reliable option is one hell of an experience and it is a great option to quickly scan the country. You'll want to make note of any public holidays or peak tourist travel times and book your tickets in advance. This can be done online or through many of the tourist agencies spread throughout the country. Any otherwise, a few days in advance is plenty of time to firm up your plans. We did the train as an overnight option to save on a hotel. There's several classes of coach available. The most popular amongst backpackers, without a doubt, is the air conditioner sleeper berth cars. They'll come in either a six bed or a four bed configuration. You'll also have the option of purchasing a hard berth or a soft berth. The difference here is a few inches of mattress thickness. Your luggage travels with you inside your berth. Beneath the lower level beds, there's space for backpacks, luggage, etc. Unless you are traveling in groups of four or six, be prepared to share your room with others. Maybe a lot of others. It's not uncommon for parents to bring along children and share the bed. In some cases, train employees will look for empty beds to knock out a nap between cities. If you do decide to go the train route, two things that you should bring with you are snacks and toilet paper. You can buy snacks and drinks on board, but bringing it with you saves the trip between carts. The trains will make periodic stops at which you have the station vendors selling food and snack items just in case you forgot to bring any with you or you want to try out the local items. The bathrooms are extremely basic, but they get the job done. There's sometimes toilet paper available, but I cannot stress this enough. Always keep some on you for those just in case moments. Always keep it on you. Like I mentioned, it is an aging system, but a reliable one and definitely one that you should check off your list at least once while visiting Vietnam. Go in with an open mind and you will certainly be rewarded. There's an awesome website with tons of information about trains in Vietnam and where to buy tickets. We're going to link it below if you have any questions. One thing we noticed this last trip were the amazing deals on low cost air carriers. We debated taking the train from Da Nang to Hanoi, a journey that we had previously done by train, but the overall time to price ratio really didn't make sense for us. For a four person air conditioned sleeper car, one bed would have costed us around 60 US dollars and taken 17 to 18 hours. We found a flight on Vietjet for $43 a person, including our bag. The flight took roughly an hour and 20 minutes. In this case, the money we would have saved on a hotel night on the train, we used for a hotel and maximized our time on the ground in Hanoi. Point being, do a little research when you're mapping out your route and see what makes the most sense for your time and budget. Once you've gotten to your destination, renting a motorbike can help you cover a lot of ground. Motorbikes are everywhere you turn in Vietnam and renting them is easy. Most places will ask to hold your passport or a copy of your passport. As travelers, we need our passports on us just in case something happens. So an alternative is to leave a large amount of cash, generally equivalent to around $100 to $200. This covers the motorbike owners should something happen to their bike. The average going rate of a motorbike rental in Vietnam is around $5 a day. You can negotiate down based on the more days you rent. I think the cheapest we ever rented a motorbike for was around $3.50 a day. So everyone's question is, do I need a license to drive in Vietnam? Technically, yes. From what we understand, an international driver's license is not valid in Vietnam. As of right now, that's true. We checked our IDL and Vietnam is not listed as a supporting country. Nonetheless, driver's licenses are not brought up when renting motorbikes and police aren't typically going out of their way to stop foreigners unless you're breaking a serious law. As you can probably tell, there's a very large gray area with this subject, so take it how you like. We've never gotten an official Vietnamese driver's license in the two years that we've been going to Vietnam and we've never really had any issues. But then again, we've never gotten to an accident or had any major infractions. Vietnam is one of those places in Southeast Asia where quality meets affordability. When we're out on the road, we typically aim to spend $20 or less on a hotel room, and that can get you a pretty nice room. Out of all the third-party booking apps that we've used, Agoda is killing the game in Southeast Asia. 
We found Agoda to consistently drive the best prices on hotels in Vietnam. Not only was it able to beat out other apps, but the Agoda Cash option is the reward money for booking on their site, and it comes in handy when you're booking a lot. We did want to mention that in some of the larger cities, Airbnb gives Agoda a run for its money. We were able to find some awesome places in Saigon and Hanoi on Airbnb, which were centrally located, more economical and more spacious than a hotel room. We'll link them below in case you're traveling to either of those cities. Pretty basic when it comes to apps here. Grab WhatsApp, Agoda, Google Translate, and Google Maps are gonna be your go-tos. If you're used to Uber or Lyft and are headed to Asia, forget everything you know. Grab is king here. Actually, Uber and Lyft don't even work in the country, so an important thing to do before you leave for Vietnam or Asia as a whole is download the Grab app. Don't worry, the functionality is the same as with Uber or Lyft, so no crash courses needed here. If you aren't one of the 1.5 billion users already, download WhatsApp on your phone. It's a great method of communication between locals and other tourists that you'll meet. Facebook Messenger is also a great backup option for getting people's contact information and sending messages. We tried using MapsMe a few times, but it did not accurately deliver. Between audio issues and incorrect directions, we decided to switch to Google Maps. Google Maps has up-to-date mapping and can also work offline by downloading maps while on Wi-Fi. We would highly recommend having Google Maps on your phone when trotting around different cities. Vietnamese is a difficult language to speak. Its orthography is Latin-based, so it's fairly easy to see a word and kind of understand the pronunciation, but because Vietnamese has so many tones, the margin of error of incorrect pronunciation is high. Jen and I had several pronunciation standoffs with some friendly locals, and although we were close, we were never on the money. Please don't take this in an intimidating way. You should always try to learn, or at least attempt, speaking in the local language whenever you're traveling. This is a great sign of reverence and shows that you are a respectful tourist. Nonetheless, having an app translator is a great support tool and can really make your life easier. Google Translate is a great solution and you can download languages for offline use. Try it out before your trip to get familiar and see what you think. Bon Mi and Pho, we get it. You know of the infamous Bon Mi and the highly prized Pho, but we challenge you to eat outside of the box. Look, if you're nervous about eating street food, don't be. General rule of thumb and a helpful guide to eating from street vendors is, if you can see where the food's being prepared, where the dishes are being clean, and if the produce looks fresh, you're gonna be fine. Shake off any raw vegetables that have residual water on them. With that being said, in all of Southeast Asia, you should never drink from the sink. As for ice, if they're serving it, it's clean. In fact, a lot of the beer here is served over ice. Vietnam has some of the most simple yet complex dishes that we've had. Eat from the streets, go to the popular stalls filled with nothing but locals, and get out of your comfort zone. Try anything. Try everything. By the end of your trip, you should aim to at least know three to five dishes aside from banh mi and pho that will be your go-tos. Here's a few examples of our favorites. Nim Nuang. These are grilled pork skewers. They're served with rice paper, loads of fresh herbs, and a sauce. They're light and a great option for a snack or for lunch. Bun Bo Wei. This soup gives pho a run for its money. It's super fragrant, it has its own unique taste, and leaves you wanting more. Mi Quang. One of the more slept on dishes, this central Vietnamese dish is rich and hearty. If you like the taste of pork, this one's for you. Cao Lao. This Hoi An specialty has a unique taste due to the process of making the noodle. It is served with thin slices of pork, pork skin, greens, and herbs, and finished off with a sweet sauce. Check out our Hoi An video for a more detailed look at the foundation and preparation of this dish. Ban Seo. It's like an omelet, but it's not an omelet. Ban Seo gets its yellow appearance from turmeric added in a rice batter. Like traditional Vietnamese food, it's served alongside a garden amount of greens, rice paper, and fish sauce. A good bonseo is light and crispy, and by far, our favorite one we had was with Vu during our Saigon Street Eats tour. We get a lot of comments on how we can communicate with the locals when we don't speak the language. We ran into a surprisingly large amount of Vietnamese people that could speak or at least understand English. It was honestly very refreshing and very helpful. Having an app like Google Translate can really help you out, but if you decide to go rogue, learning how to say hello, thank you, and that's delicious can take you surprisingly far. When all else fails, body language and a big smile is a great backup. As we mentioned in the app section, Google Translate's a great tool to have for those just-in-case moments. Vietnam is about 1,000 miles from north to south. 
which leaves a lot of room for weather variants. Aside from the north of the country and some of the highlands in the central region, the weather ranges from warm to hot. We recommend packing light, breathable clothing and comfortable shoes. Shorts and shirts made with polyester or nylon are a great choice. 100% cotton shirts and shorts are okay too, but they tend to trap a little bit more heat and take some time to dry out. Try to pack at least three to five pairs of shorts and five to seven shirts. Ladies, I know it's tempting to bring a lot, but try to hold back and limit yourself. Reversible tanks are a great option for a change of scenery, and I highly recommend wearing clothing that is breathable and flowy. It can get hot here. Be sure to pack some more modest clothing or longer dresses and skirts as you will need this to get into certain religious related attractions. Try to limit yourself to only two to three pairs of shoes and only bring comfortable ones. A pair of flip flops or sandals and sneakers should do. Speaking of shoes, if you like to walk around and explore, you're gonna wanna pack comfortable shoes. I don't have any specific recommendations, but use what works best for you wherever you live. If you feel more comfortable in a pair of flip flops and can manage being on your feet all day in them, then that's totally fine and acceptable too. In some Vietnamese homestays, restaurants, and even buses, it's expected that you remove your footwear before entering. My biggest recommendation is bring something that isn't gonna be very hard to remove and put back on constantly. We brought water shoes when we first got to Asia, but we rarely used them. We typically only brought them out when we were hiking the waterfalls, and even then, most of the time, we just managed to do everything in flip-flops. Eventually, we realized that they were taking up too much space and weight in our bag, so we got rid of them. Listen, hiking boots are an overkill. We never made it to Sapa, which is the mountainous region in the north of the country, and maybe there, just maybe, we would consider packing hiking boots. Everywhere else we've been in Vietnam and other countries in Southeast Asia, we've never truly felt like we've needed boots. I'll put it like this. Unless you're hardcore into trekking, hiking, and everything else that comes with that territory, skip the boots. They're too heavy and too bulky. Warm clothing. Should you bring it? Yes, if you're planning on visiting a place like Dalat. Dalat's centrally located in the country, and during the daytime it gets to be pretty chilly, and at nighttime it will get even full-blown cold. Here's a peace of mind for a little peace of mind. If you forgot to bring something, don't worry, you can always pick it up there. Clothing is sold virtually everywhere in Vietnam, so you'll be able to pick up anything you need from shorts to shirts to long sleeves and coats and so on. They also carry clothes in a variety of sizes, so even if you're very small or large, you'll be straight. Just in case you're nervous about the weather, we're gonna include a great link below where you can find more information for your trip. Clothing aside, the other things that we brought that were very important were sunscreen and mosquito repellent. You can always pick up sunscreen anywhere you go in Asia, but it tends to come in smaller amounts, the SPF might be limited, and it's a little more expensive than back home. Convenience stores aren't only limited to sunscreen, they have almost every toiletry item that you can think of. We've mentioned bug repellent in our previous No BS guides, and we'll mention it here again. Look, do not waste your time or your money with those mosquito sprays and stuff for your clothing in your bags. Mosquitoes are not interested in your clothing. We found that the best bug repellent to travel with is this mosquito lotion by Ultrathon. It's conveniently small and it packs a punch. A little of this stuff goes a long way. So put a few dots on, rub in, and you'll be safeguarded for at least six to 12 hours. Another item that you don't necessarily need to pack because you can find it there, is toilet paper. The only catch is a lot of public restrooms will not have toilet paper. So when nature calls, or if you're a girl and you just need toilet paper, make sure to always have some on you. Lastly, we'll close this section out with recyclable bags. Not only in Vietnam, but a lot of places in Asia go overboard with their plastic products. They're great for business owners because they're cheap, convenient, and great for distribution. They're also terrible for the environment should they not be disposed of properly. Pack a recyclable bag with you and carry it around in your pocket. You'll most likely be buying things as you go and you can help cut down the overuse of plastic products. An itinerary would be far too much to include in this video, but we are working on a separate video that will break down a suggested one week, two week, and three week itinerary for your travels to Vietnam. So stay tuned for that. A savvy traveler will approach this topic in a few different ways. Look, we are long past the days of traveler's checks, so it's either you bring cash or plastic with you. For Asia specifically, we opted to take dollars with us to exchange as needed. Most currency exchange houses and banks do not charge a transaction fee to exchange, so you'll walk out with the daily exchange rate. 
We're not telling you to not bring your debit card, but be aware that ATMs will charge a foreign transaction fee plus an ATM fee, depending on who owns the actual ATM. A good workaround for this is traveling with a debit card that reimburses transaction fees. Charles Schwab debit cards don't charge currency conversion fees and offer unlimited reimbursements. So finally, make sure you do all of these before you leave for your trip. Download all of the apps that we mentioned. Figure out your money situation. Print out your e-visa approval. And take your typhoid pills. So if you've been to Vietnam before and want to share anything, be sure to drop it in the comments below to help future travelers out. As always, thanks for watching this video and be sure to subscribe so you can get first access to all of our latest releases. Smash the thumbs up button. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha!